So welcome back, everybody, uh, to another webinar organized by Princeton for everyone. We're happy to have Oleg Itzkotsky with us. Hi, Oleg, good to see you. Hi, Marcus, thanks. Great. So Oleg will talk about sanctions and the exchange rate. And uh, we are curious to see what he has to tell us, how much the, the sanctions will affect the exchange rate. Before we go to Oleg, I just would like to do a little bit of housekeeping and uh, refer to the webinars we had on sanctions before. We had Sergei Guriev who talked a lot about the Russian economy. We had Jim Hamilton talking about the implications for the oil market. And then we had David Barkas and Ben Moll talking about the implications of sanctions or in particular called Turkey sanctions on the German economy looking at an aggregate production function. Then we had uh, Elena Rybakova talking much more about the details going from pipeline to pipeline and also the financial implications of that. And today, Oleg will talk about the implications on the exchange rate. And I stole a picture and a figure of Oleg's paper where he actually analyzes uh, the exchange rate. And he shows that, you know, the ruble was initially uh, depreciating and then currently is appreciating again. So since the war started uh, in the Ukraine, the Russia invaded the Ukraine, uh, actually the ruble first became much weaker because of the sanctions, but since then it actually came back and is even stronger than it was uh, initially. And um, I would also like to, what's the advantage of having a strong currency? And a strong currency, if you're not very active abroad, it's still advantageous to have a strong currency. And the reason is that it actually, the perception of a strong currency signals also to your own population that actually things are sound. Uh, the probability of bank runs are going down, the inflation pressures, so the hoarding, people's uh, panicking essentially is going down. So all of this actually helps uh, a domestic policy as well. And another sign is that if you look at the policy rate, the interest rate, the central bank is setting. So you saw that you know when in 2014, the interest rate was shooting through the roof, and was going up. And then uh, recently it had to go to stabilize the exchange rate and stabilize the economy. It went up dramatically as well, but then it came down. And in contrast, which is the Ukrainian uh, figure, so that's the policy rate for Ukraine, that's the blue one, it went up and it did not come down. So the policy rate is actually also uh, very interesting to look at on top of the exchange rate. Finally, I would like to say a few words about the Russian strategy. And that actually led to this record trade surpluses. And that's I took from Robin Brooks' uh, Twitter feeds. Essentially, uh, Russia is trying to use to export oil at a very high price to the rest of the world, in particular to China. And here you see how the exporting uh, to over the years, how it changed and how it actually increased dramatically to China's export, the oil export in particular, uh, to China compared to uh, the previous years. And you also see that uh, exports in dollar value actually is going through the roof because the oil prices are going so high, is so, are so high. Imports went down. So you see the red, the red area below the zero line, these are the imports. The imports went down and total trade surplus for Russia went up significantly. So you saw um, an improvement of, of the trade surplus. Russia always, as you have heard earlier, always had a positive trade surplus, but now it is even stronger than before. Of course, imports uh, because of trade sanctions went down, but exports are still doing extremely well. So with this, I would like to go to Oleg's poll questions and uh, the answers you gave us uh, for these questions. And the first one was, you should become a predictor of the exchange rate in the future. Uh, as, you, as we have seen, ex the exchange rate first depreciated in the beginning of the war and then appreciated again. And do you think it will be stronger at the end of this year or similar what it is now, but in 65 and 80, or it will be much weaker where you need 80 rubles to buy $1? And people said about 20% were it will be stronger than that, than 65. Uh, so below 65, so it has, you have to need fewer rubles to buy $1. But it will be similar, it's about 55% said. So majority thinks it will be staying where it is uh, at between 65 and 80. And weaker, that's what the 25 side. So it's a little bit like majority is clearly it will be similar. Um, and then it's a little bit on the weaker side, but not much and somehow on the stronger side. So it's uh, fairly uh, stable. That's what people think. Second question was, um, 
the West concentrated sanctions on Russia on imports rather than exports, will this make it easier or is it than uh, for Russia to finance its war, or is equally effective, or it doesn't really matter because uh, the short-term fiscal deficit is independent of uh, the way whether you impose sanctions on imports or exports. And the answers are easier. People thought 53%, or so the majority thought it will make it easier for Russia to fund the, the, the war. It's equally effective whether you focus on imports or exports, that's 21%. And it didn't matter as it's independent of uh, the short-term fiscal deficit. It's mostly funded with rubles and other things as uh, 26%. So just to get an idea, hopefully you will think differently after listening to Oleg's talk or get confirmed what you thought. And finally, Oleg put uh, forward three statements and which one do you assign to most likely and the first one, the West does not have sufficient leverage against Russia, economic leverage, and should not use sanctions. Only 9% thought this way. And the second statement was, the West does not have sufficient leverage against Russia, and nonetheless should use sanctions. That's what 72% thought. So the majority, big majority thought, we don't really have leverage over Russia, but we should do it nevertheless. Even it might hurt us. Uh, of course, it hurts us as well. And the final answer, the final statement was, uh, we have the West has sufficient economic leverage against Russia, but should not use it. And that's what uh, the 19% said. So it's 9%, 72%, and 19%. Okay, with this, I pass on the floor to Oleg, and uh, we have an interesting perspective, and he will tell us how we should think differently and how we should have answered his questions. So Oleg, the floor is yours. We're looking forward to your presentation. Uh, thanks so much, Marcus. Uh, I want to say that, uh, you know, I obviously followed a lot of the webinars at uh, BCF over the pandemic and the recent seminars on sanctions. Um, so I'm, you know, very pleased uh, to be here. Um, you know, obviously this war, the way I think about it, it's, a, it's an event in scale and sort of like the risks and threats associated with this event to me are actually considerably larger than those associated with the pandemic. Obviously, the, uh, you know, this is the um, you know, first instance of a full-scale war in Europe since the end of the Second World War. It's a completely unprecedented event. Uh, it has all sorts of unpredictable um, uh, risks involved with it. And obviously, to the, even to the extent it has not immediately touch some parts of the world yet, but it's definitely an event that there is a lot of focus to and, uh, you know, um, hard to stay uh, impartial. I mean, especially in light of the fact of, you know, this cherished peace uh, on the European continent uh, over the last 75 years, right, that this clear, you know, clearly breaks the, you know, all, all sorts of norms in that regard. Um, so I will talk uh, on a fairly narrow um, topic here is it's this, you know, very kind of um, scientific positive approach uh, to the way sanctions affect the exchange rate and to the way shocks affect the exchange rate without going into any kind of normative uh, prescriptions on this talk. And, you know, as you will see, I think it's fairly easy to reach sort of a, a consensus, you know, what happened to the ruble. Uh, and it's much harder uh, to reach a consensus what's the right course of actions and policies, right, uh, for the West, how to deal with this crisis uh, and with the war. Uh, and so this is something I'm going to leave out for the, for the most part of the, of the talk, but, you know, maybe it will come up, come up in questions. And so, you know, if you Google um, the best performing currents of 2022, uh, Right, so you're gonna uh, come up with Google search outcome, something like this, right? So, you know, uh, New York Times on top gives a rather kind of uh, impartial view that it just reaches a seven year high, but then you can find a lot of articles that are, you know, about the best performing currency, really stating it in the terms like there is a race and, you know, there are currencies that do well and currencies that do poorly. And so ruble is the best performing currency. And, you know, even, uh, you know, the uh, last um, um, the last uh, reference here, uh, somewhat sensational, that it baffles American economists. So hopefully, I mean, it will be clear that actually the behavior of the ruble is quite easy to rationalize within very standard models of exchange rates, and that that's going to be the 
uh, you know, the purpose of this talk. So uh, Marcus took this uh, picture, but it was somewhat outdated, right? So now this is the picture that is extended. Uh, you know, the paper was completed a little while ago, basically sometimes in May, but, um, you know, since then the ruble has appreciated further. And so what's interesting is that in between large crisis episodes, the Russian central bank has maintained a very stable uh, exchange rate, right? And so since 2014, 2015, that was the previous crisis episode, the first round of the war in Ukraine on a much smaller scale than now, than the decline uh, in oil prices uh, that persisted for many years, right? Uh, the Russian central bank kind of, well, so there was a depreciation of the ruble from 35 to 75, and it stayed at 75. Uh, over eight years. So it was very, very stable. So if you extend it backwards, it was very, very stable. And before 2014, it was very stable at 35 for the previous something like 12 years, right? Uh, you know, since the previous crisis in 98, 99, right? And so this is a completely unusual extent of volatility or, you know, uh, variation in the, in the ruble exchange rate. And indeed, right as the war started on February 24, there was a, you know, massive depreciation of the ruble. Ruble was taken off from many international exchanges because, you know, foreign investors could no longer invest in uh, assets in Russia, ruble denominated assets and so on. And so this is really the data from the Moscow exchange where there is a, you know, there is a, a real market uh, exchange of ruble to many different currencies within the Russian economy. So it's very important to also keep in mind that it's no longer connected very tightly to the world financial market. It's sort of like a local market for the currency in Russia with a lot of restrictions on who can invest and hold, you know, assets in different currencies, you know, and, and like sell them and uh, uh, ex expropriate revenues or incomes from, from the trade. So in that sense, it's a reasonable assumption to think that it's been disconnected from the financial market, right? And so there was this steep depreciation. And then surprisingly, some around a month into the war, uh, ruble started appreciating. And at first it looked like central bank just managed to stabilize the value of the ruble, but then it became very apparent that it's a, you know, it's a prominent trend for strengthening of the ruble. At first it seemed that maybe the central bank wants to return it uh, back to, you know, 75 to the pre-war level, but ruble appreciated towards, you know, 55 now. So it's at record high indeed in the last couple of weeks, which is even further extended here. So it's around 55. Right. And in that sense, the poll question was like, are you random walk forecasters? You know, do you believe it will stay at 55 or there are like fundamental forces for it to return to the pre-war level at some point, which is here, or it will be weaker uh, than that. Right. And so it's sort of interesting to think through what are the forces that could, you know, either keep ruble very appreciated or um, lead to a, a, a depreciation and to what extent. And so what I'm going to do here. So, you know, first of all, the a basic question is like, how come ruble depreciated so much initially and appreciated thereafter to levels uh, beyond the pre-war levels? Uh, given that, can we conclude that sanctions are not working? So this is a typical question posed and, you know, uh, commentaries is like, if ruble appreciates so much, does it mean that sanctions were wasteful? They didn't work. They didn't reach uh, any results. Alternatively, some people saying, well, no, it's not that sanctions are not working maybe exchange rate is just an irrelevant variable. As, we, as I mentioned, you know, uh, there is lots of financial repression, financial restrictions on capital flows, on what the foreigners can do, on what the domestic uh, agents can do. And maybe exchange rate is altogether irrelevant, you know, uh, uh, somewhat like in Soviet Union, there was a, an exchange rate of the ruble then, the ruble was stronger than a dollar, and but nobody really cared about it all that much. It was sort of like an artificial variable, right? And the question is, is it kind of the case now or nonetheless exchange rate is an allocative variable and we should pay attention to it, right? And, uh, you know, another important question is, does it have a relationship with government revenues? Do the sanctions, the movement and exchange rate have consequences for uh, revenues of the government budget and the ability of the government to finance different things, in particular finance the war, but also the domestic expenditure, right? And so in that sense, you know, if it does, through which mechanism uh, do the sanctions work? So these are the questions I would uh, address uh, in the talk today. So Oleg can ask, is there a black market on the streets in Moscow where I can swap rubles for dollars? In the 
first part, there was a little emergence of uh, alternative exchange rates. So it was not quite clear that there was a single exchange rate, but to a large extent, it was not like in Soviet Union where you know, the exchange rate differed an order of magnitude. Uh, it differed, you know, maybe 10%. Uh, it was unclear what is the you know, black market exchange rate. And at, at this point, it seems pretty clear that there is no secondary, uh, secondary market. So it all converged to this exchange rate. So as soon as there was no more pressure on depreciation, there is essentially no uh, shadow secondary market. Yeah. Can you do some counterfactuals? So somebody asked if you, if there were cold turkey sanctions on February 25th of 2022, the exchange rate would have moved very differently? That Yes. So this is a good question. And hopefully, like, I'll explain the mechanism. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what, how are we going to approach this question? So we have earlier work uh, with Dima, which builds, you know, fairly rich models for thinking about exchange rates and uh, different market kind of conditions, different circumstances. So here we're going to take those models and really simplify them a lot. So we're going to keep only the essential parts that are needed for us to make the points. So in particular, you know, we're going to go to a small open economy version of the model, completely streamlined uh, in all sort of dimensions to only focus really on exchange rate, uh, you know, real cost of living, inflation in the sense of real cost of living and the government revenue. So this would be three endogenous outcomes we really focus on. And we're going to take a lot of the other things as exogenously given to the economy. So in particular, the, the extent of a recession, we're going to read off sort of the, the, the approach would be to read it off the data, right? If there is a recession or if there is a decline in experts or there is sort of like some, some changes in other circumstances, you treat it, for example, changes in financing conditions, the international interest rate, availability of foreign funds. We're going to treat it as sort of like a stochastic path of shocks that hit the economy, and we're going to focus on their implications for these three objects, right? So that, that, that's why the model is so simple. We don't have to think, you know, the mechanism behind the recession and model it, right? We're sort of going to take it as given and see what are the implications uh, for, for these endogenous variables that we're interested in. But on the other hand, we're going to sort of like bring in a very rich set of sanctions and uh, policy instruments that were available to the Russian government, Russian central bank. And this is where the model will be sort of rich, right? Um, okay, and so the key thing we're gonna emphasize is the dual role of the exchange rate, that it plays both a role in the goods market and in an asset market. And this is where our approach is perhaps somewhat different from, uh, from the rest of the literature. And so let me kind of summarize it very uh, quickly here, sort of the way our approach works is we really want to think about the currency market. It's not typical in macro models. In macro models, we typically state everything in terms of goods flows and sort of the currency flows is the backside of goods flows. And we never sort of typically write them explicitly. Uh, we just sort of write everything in terms of value of the goods that cross the border. And we do not typically have a separate currency market in, in, in most international macro models, even though it's there but it's sort of the backside of the goods market and there is no need to kind of write a separate set of equations that repeat the goods market equations, right? But here we really want to focus on a currency market where there would be a dual role of exchange rate. And so the idea is that there are two potential uses of currency. Uh, you can, you know, if you have currency that comes to the economy, you can use it to buy imports. Uh, and so soon I will, you know, have the full set of equations. You'll see where, you know, where this, uh, uh, where this notation is coming from. So, so far it's just a shorthand. So this is like expenditure and imports, but, you know, in principle, the alternative use of dollars and euros that come into the economy is to use them as vehicles for saving. If you lose trust in the domestic currency, in domestic stock market, uh, in the domestic, uh, you know, uh, deposits and rubles, right? The dollars and euros that come uh, into the country uh, could be used as a vehicle for savings, right? And this is the alternative use of currency. And in that sense, in the currency market, uh, you know, there is this competition, whether you're going to use the euros and dollars that come in to buy imports, or you will use them as savings vehicles, right? In the, in the absence of other safe assets inside the economy, right? So the two sources of currency would be exports, and accumulated net foreign assets. So you can think of accumulated net foreign assets as the, you know, the past accumulated net exports, trade surpluses that were converted into net foreign assets. And this is the supply of currency in the economy. And it's, it's actually very, very simple. 
exchange rate has to balance the supply and demand of currency. And so if currency is scarce, right, if dollars and euros are scarce in the economy from the point of view of trying to buy imports and saving in, 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 those, uh, in those vehicles, right, then the currency will, uh, the ruble will depreciate and the foreign currency will appreciate, make, make this foreign currency more expensive. Right. And by making it more expensive, it would discourage imports and would discourage savings to balance out the market. Right. On opposite, if uh, there is not much desire for this and there is a lot of inflow of, you know, experts and a big stock of net foreign assets, it's, it's a, a abundance of supply of foreign currencies and foreign currency depreciates. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, this is sort of the reason why the ruble would uh, would appreciate. And so you see how different it is from. Uh, kind of like a conventional uh, macro model. So oftentimes conventional macro models just focus on the flows of goods and they just equalize, you know, imports and exports. Uh, and so it would be all about the force between imports uh, and exports. Uh, so here there is this additional forces that would come into play and I will try to focus on those. And so the other thing which is true about conventional models is that, well, so if, you know, if private agents want to, save in dollars, they have a particular preference for it, but the financial market is not segmented. We think of financial assets as being highly substitutable. As long as they pay comparable interest rates or expected interest rates, we think of the financial instruments as rather substitutable, even taking into account risk premium and so on. And in that sense, if you know, you know, Russians would feel very strongly about saving in dollars and euros, and there is access to the foreign financial market, right? They would just be able to exchange the currencies, and this would sort of essentially drop out as a force from determining the exchange rate, right? Uh, but in sort of this more recent class of models, generation of models with either segmented markets or models with convenience sealed on various assets, where like everybody wants to hold money in uh, dollars, you break the uh, this high substitutability between assets and different currencies, and this can become a very strong force be behind movements you know, this becomes a very important force behind uh, movements and currencies. And this would be the type of model we're uh, working here. So, so Oleg, do you allow to have a Russian safe asset as well? And is it beyond the ruble or is it some, you know, real estate or gold or something as a safe asset? Ye account? Yes, I would not be very, like, it's very easy to spell it out further. I will have a ruble bond. I will not kind of spell out more assets that are available, but this would be a model of convenience sealed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so you'll see in a second exactly how we bring it in. Uh, so, so basically, they would, we would model it as if Russians deem, you know, dollar savings as safer than alternative assets available in the economy since the beginning of the war. Mm -hmm. And, of course, if we, everything is endogenous, so things, you know, whether something is safe or is not safe, and it has a risk premium, an endogenous risk premium, do you have multiplicity of equilibria too, or we can postpone this? Yes. So these models typically can result in multiplicity of equilibria and the government can try to pick the one with lower volatility of exchange rate. And that mm -hmm. could be the goal of either monetary policy or foreign exchange interventions. Okay. So typically these models allow for it. It's not going to be something I'm going to analyze, but it's true that there could be, uh, you know, there could be possible equilibria with a lot of volatility of the exchange rate. Okay. Yeah. So here you assume that the Central Bank of Russia is picking the best one or the least volatile one. Yes, and so what's very interesting about this picture that this picture is a, depicts the trends as opposed to high volatility, right? So this is using daily data. And what strikes you here is that there was a big trend on depreciation and a big trend on appreciation as opposed to a huge increase in you know, daily volatility of the exchange rate, right? And so is there the, some yeah, correlation with the, with the oil and gas price? Uh, so, I mean, th there was no break like that in oil prices. No, but the daily, I, so if you look at the zigzag, is whenever the gas price moves up, the exchange rate appreciates and or is, because the yeah. revenue but, from the exports are going up. No? Yeah, so my guess would be that it doesn't operate at those high frequencies, yeah. but it's an interest. yeah, it's something interesting to check, right? whether there was a high frequency correlation. Uh, to, to me, again, my goal here would be to explain the like slow moving trends as opposed to, you know, daily or intraday uh, correlation and exchange rate. Yeah, but it's a it's a good question. Um, okay, so the model is very very simple. It's only one slide for the model, uh, and so yeah. So as I mentioned, it's going to be this endowment small open economy with 
tradables and non-tradables. So the key feature would be that there are tradables and non-tradables and it would be endowment an endowment economy. So I don't need to think about uh, you know, production, disruption and supply chains. It will all be taken uh, as given. And so what the additional ingredient would be this extra demand for foreign currency as a savings vehicle, right? And the way we're gonna capture it is that uh, there is the household sector and they want to consume the domestic good and there is an endowment of the domestic good each period that they consume, you know, and then there are imports. And so they really will be deciding on the quantity of imports. So that would be really the, you know, they decided on quantity of both, but this follows endowment. And so the truly the endogenous variable, which will be determined together with the exchange rate would be the quantity of imports, but there could be sanctions that are imposed on imports, which change the, you know, for example, the prices that you face to buy uh, a bundle of imports, right? Uh, um, and then there is this demand for uh, holdings of uh, foreign currency. So the star will always refer to foreign currency. And so this is the holding of foreign currency. And sort of this is in real terms where P star is sort of how much imports you can buy uh, for the amount of um, foreign currency holdings that you have. So basically we model it here as like a hedging device um, against like an increase in the cost of living on the import side, right? And so this is the shock. And so this shock would, you know, we will switch it on since the war has started. And so this is, we think of it as a precautionary savings mechanism, right? That, that, that's sort of common in the literature. You can, you can kind of create it in different ways. Think about the Agari economy, uh, you know, the increase in idiosyncratic risks, increase the demand for safe assets. And especially if you don't deem anything else that, as a safe asset anymore, right? Like uh, for example, the stock market, was put on hold. It has not. It was not traded since the beginning of the war for a number of weeks. Uh, the bank deposits were frozen to a large extent, and so then you know there is this big shift towards the use of foreign, you know, foreign currency as uh, as a safe asset, uh, right? And so that's what the way we're going to capture it, right? And okay. so uh, mm -hmm. the the riskiness of the foreign bond, the B star, this exchange rate in it, no. So if, yeah, if so the, the whole thing is more risky, does it reflect it in the V function? So the concavity of the V function, is this captured as? Uh, so V is more like marginal utility from holding the real balances, but there would be an earlier equation, which mm -hmm. would reflect the risk of holding it, which is inside the exchange rate, right? So there would be an earlier equation, which, have, which will have a term from here and a term from here, and the risk will be captured by it. Again, it will not be the dominant focus for us. We're going to focus on interplay between this use of currency and the use of currency to buy imports. That would be really where the interesting stuff happens in this paper, right? And so this would be the utility function, you know, CES utility over home and foreign good with elasticity theta. This is really going to be the only elasticity that will play a role in our analysis. And this would be the function, the way you want to hold uh, foreign currency. So there is the ideal level of holdings, which is C. And so you, you're trying to minimize uh, sort of the departure of your real balances in foreign currency relative to PSI. And so if there is a shock to PSI, you want to change your real, uh, real balances of foreign, uh, of, foreign, of foreign currency right here, right? And so then, you know, in terms of your expenditure, you spend it on the home good and on imports. This is the nominal exchange rate. So when it goes up, it's a depreciation of the ruble. So you have to pay more in ruble terms for a unit of imports, uh, even holding the prices, uh, the foreign currency prices of imports constant. So this are returns on the bonds. You can hold the home currency bond in rubles with this interest rate or the foreign currency bond. And this is the interest rate that the household can receive. And it will have an H on it to reflect that this is what the households can get. And so this is some type of a wage commitment from the rest of the economy towards the household, right? So this is the wage bill uh, that they expect to receive as the payment. So now the second entity in the economy, it, it will be a combined sector. Can I sector. ask you a quick question? Because you yep. have this, this subscript T plus one in it. Can you just explain why? So what, oh, you, what is the household yeah, you, choosing? Yeah, no, in, in the, the, in the, the bond function. position today and you carry it into tomorrow. So it's, it's really, this T plus one is just a time convention that you come into the period with this amount of rubles mm -hmm. in terms of your savings and this amount of, uh, this amount of foreign currency in terms of your savings. And at the end of the period, you choose the, you know, your financial positions to go, your savings basically to go into and the I, I derive the utility period. from PT plus one, the PT star T plus one. Yes. So this is not, this will not be of much consequence. You can do, you can okay. do the previous right. period here. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
and I'll show the earlier equation in a second. Uh, so what's the interesting in terms of our model, and we really will think about the government, the, the, the production side of the economy and the financial sector as one sector, as one union. So think about it as Gazprom is a part of a government and Sberbank is the part of the government. So both the financial sector, the biggest you know, banks are all government owned, the biggest commodity producers are government owned, but in fact, you know, like a lot of the non-tradables inside the country are government owned as well. So if you think about transportation, to a large extent it's government owned, the domestic banking system, the, you know, um, medical services and uh, educational services are largely government owned, right? And even the companies that have a, a chunk of private ownership oftentimes have some control from the government and oftentimes the government directly controls employment in those places by providing subsidies, for example, not to fire workers, even from private uh, enterprises, right? And so there is this, uh, this really merger between big business and the government that really makes it justified to model it as one sector of the economy, right? And so uh, then if I look at the government, so e F will be the net foreign assets of the country and B are the privately held uh, foreign assets. And so the difference between the two, F minus B, are the reserves of the government. So the, in, in the beginning of the period, the government starts it with this amount of reserves. These are the total net foreign assets of the country in the beginning of the period, and this is privately held part of it. And so, you know, government reserves is one of the instruments that the government can use. And obviously sanctions can cover a, a target net foreign assets or government reserves, right? And so this is the international interest rate on foreign, uh, foreign savings, uh, which may or may not available uh, to the country depending on the financial sanctions, right? And this is the household interest rate on foreign currency savings, and there could be a wedge between the two. And the wedge between the two reflects financial repression. So what the government could do is depress the expected return on foreign currency savings domestically by making it very difficult to withdraw or impossible to withdraw, withdraw with a tax, or there could be a tax to convert from one currency to another. And all of this has been used, right? And so this, we're gonna capture it as a gap between these two possible uh, interest rates. And so these are measures of financial uh, repression. So this is the savings side of, you know, this government firms and financial sector. And so on the right-hand side, this is the income. And so this is the endowment of the domestic non-tradable good. This is the price level. And so we're going to think of inflation as this PT. So if there is inflation in the country, it's the change in the price level of the domestic goods, right? The cost of living depends on both this price and this price, which is the import price component. Uh, but the way we're going to sort of think of inflation is, is there truly an increase in the domestic price level of the domestic goods, right? Or this is just reflection of uh, import sanctions that raise the prices, right? So we're going to separate these two types of inflation, one from kind of monetary side of the economy, and the other one is an increase in the real cost of living because imports have become uh, less available, right? So this is the endowment of um, commodities that are sold. And so this is in foreign currency, right? So it's already expressed as revenues that you can get uh, given the world prices of commodities. If world prices of commodities go up, why star goes up? If there are sanctions on purchases on the quantity, uh, why star can go down, right? And so then, you know, this is the revenues in foreign currency and this is the exchange rate you converted back uh, into rubles. And this is the ruble revenue of the, of, of the country, of the government sector. And then uh, there are two sources of expenditure. So you have this wage commitment to the household sector. You promise to pay a sequence of wages to the household sector. And this is promised in nominal terms, right? And so if there are fiscal problems, you might face a problem of paying it in nominal terms, then you can either default on those promises or you can have inflation, which would basically shrink this in real terms. So this is kind of like a choice that could be available to the government. And this, I just, I will set it to zero because it's of no, uh, with no loss of generality, but imagine that there is a, some commitment to pay nominal wages to the household. And then there are some government expenditure, for example, government expenditure on the war, right? And so the, the government, then we can solve a kind of like a Pareto problem for the government, right? Like holding this fixed, what's the best wage promise that you can sustain? Or like if, if you need to sustain the wage promise here, uh, what is the maximum amount of expenditure you can afford on the war? And so just to point out that these are complete, competing uses of the, of the revenues, right? And so going forward, I'm just gonna normalize this to zero. 
think of it as some constant. It's not gonna, it's really not gonna change the analysis. I'm gonna just think that there is some commitment and you have to honor that commitment in some ways, right? Okay, so this is the full setup of the model. From now on, this would be just the analysis. Um, and the oligarchs, they're part of the household sector or the government sector? No, no. So, so oligarchs and firms and government are all in here and the financial okay. sector. So, okay. yes, yeah. yeah. And so in particular, this whole discussion of whether it will be the Gazprom that will get revenues from experts or the central bank is of no consequence in this model mm -hmm. because they're really part of the same sector, right? Okay. It's just relocating from one pocket of the government to another pocket of the government, which I think is a, a realistic description. Okay, and so now this is the equation that uh, Marcos was looking forward to. Uh, so first of all, there is this market clearing that the endowment of non-tradables domestically has to be consumed. And I'm just gonna assume that the domestic savings vehicle and in zero net supply, and again, it's of no consequence here, the government would provide supply of you know, you know, government bonds, for example, in rubles. They're not in very high demand, uh, and it's not of much consequence how we model it here, right? And in fact, the government has, we think of this as the government monetary policy tool. So this is what Marcus brought up in his introduction that they hiked the interest rate to 20% at first in the beginning of the war and then reduced it to 8%, I think now, or maybe even lower. Uh, and so this is how they can, we think, you know, the way we're gonna model it, there will be an earlier equation, which I'm not gonna show you for these bonds, which allows you to directly control with this interest rate, the amount of domestic inflation. So I'm just gonna think that the government has a direct control over domestic inflation by setting the policy rate. It's a simplification, uh, but you know, le like the assumption here would be that the government can control the inflation rate. And I'm gonna show you the constraints on the inflation, right? And so of course there is another hurdle is that, you know, if there is problems with the financial sector, with the domestic financial sector, this transmission from the interest rate here to control the inflation could be lost by the government. Indeed, the first couple of weeks looked like a banking panic, but it was stopped. And after that, the government regained control of you know, domestic monetary policy essentially via the domestic banking system. So I think, uh -huh. Just to understand the model better. So what's the time period here? Is it like a week or is it a quarter? So do you want to explain the whole, the, the, the rise and the fall? Or yeah. the fall and the rise, or... So one thing we don't do here is that particular quantification with numbers. <laughs> mm -hmm. It would be a qualitative model, which will yeah. rationalize the qualitative trends. And in this sense, we can think of it as a month or a quarter. Well, the trends, like the trends to depreciation what lasted for a month and then it revert and there was a quarter of appreciation. So I think a month would be a reasonable model uh, interval here. But if you want to make the model quantitative, it's actually fairly straightforward. Uh, you would probably want to uh, spell out a few more things. You probably want to, you know, depart from the endowment assumption and think a little uh, mm -hmm. through how to sort of model substitutability more. Uh, also, maybe not make this a perishable endowment, but really think through the intertemporal decisions of when you extract oil. Again, I'm just going to take it all as sort of given. Uh, but the only so the shock to the model is subsidy. Is this correct? Per period, no, as a new no. so, so the shocks would be this. Oh, okay. That's yes, yeah, so it comes here. Uh, uh, oh, no, oh, so I didn't spell out the shocks. Let me tell you the shocks on the slide. Endowment of like oil revenues is a shock, okay. and it's subject to both international oil prices and sanctions. Domestic endowment is a shock in the sense that it could be a domestic recession, which will read it as a shock to the economy. Uh, import sanctions, which will affect this, and the increase in the demand for safe, uh, safe, safe assets. So these are the four shocks that we really are okay. uh, going to focus on. And then the policy instruments I spell out here. So the government controls inflation, financial repression, and reserves. So this would be the main. And I didn't, I didn't put here the domestic interest rate, but implicitly, this is what allows you to control the, the inflation. So these are the three instruments I'm going to give the government. And then the endogenous variables would be imports, exchange rate, and the extent of foreign currency savings by the household. Right, so we're gonna read off the shocks, the policies, and study the effect on this this vector. So, so Oliver Landman would like to know whether does the model help to answer why Russia would like to be paid in rubles instead of dollars? Yeah, so this is very interesting. So uh, this is really the reason we started working on it because mm -hmm. the appreciation seemed intuitive to us that it should happen, but like this idea of paying in rubles seemed to be outside of economics, right? And so what we can confirm is what I mentioned is like. 
really what it does, it relocates the euros from the pocket of Gazprom to the pocket of central bank. Mm -hmm. And from the point of our model, it makes no difference. And we believe in real world that really makes no difference. There, there are two sort of reasons. Uh, and so also the payments and rubles of the foreign debt, which was discussed this week, right? So it feels like a political positioning, political gesture in the sense that if I tell you to pay in rubles, you'll pay in rubles. And if I tell you to dance when you receive the gas, you'll dance. And, you know, Germans and Italians and, you know, Hungarians will gladly dance to receive Russian oil and gas and pay in rubles, right? And so, that, like, I think largely that's the biggest part of the story. Uh, but uh, the, the other part of the story could be that it somehow makes it easier to hide the transactions and the payment systems. I, you know, I don't, I cannot kind of provide any support for that. Uh, but this is only other possible, or maybe it's like a first step and some longer kind of idea of how to hide the transactions from the, you know, European regulators or something like that. But in this model, there is no room for this to make a difference. It's really of no consequence. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So now uh, back to the equations. Uh, and, and Marcos, do I have about 15 minutes or a little longer? A little longer. Okay, Five good. Minutes. Okay, very good. So he, he, there, there will be three equations. So three variables that we need to determine, three equations. So one is a crucial equation in these types of models. On the good side, it's the expenditure switching condition or import demand. And the idea is that you choose between consumption of imports and consumption of the domestic good, which needs to equal to endowment and equilibrium as a function of the relative price of the two. And so if imports become expensive relative to the domestic goods, right? you will want to shift away from imports. And this is the form that equilibrates on the sort of demand side for goods, right? And so this is the elasticity of demand. And so this condition must be satisfied, right? And so, you know, movements in exchange rate are needed to in particular clear this market, right? The goods market, the expenditure switching between domestic consumption and import consumption. And so import sanctions will also target this market. The second can you, equation can you is- remind the reader also what, what gamma is? Oh, and the gamma is just uh, the weight that you put on inputs. It's, mm -hmm. it's just a normalization, right? Like typically we think of economists as rather closed to international trade in the sense that they have a lot of home bias. And so small gamma reflects the fact that you disproportionately consume domestic goods, but there is a chunk of your consumption that goes to expenditure that goes to imports. Yeah. So this is one equation. The second equation is even simpler. It's the intertemporal budget constraint of the country. So we consolidate the government and the household. So essentially we just sum the government and uh, business uh, budget constraint with the household budget constraint, cancel a bunch of terms like the W, uh, domestic bond, which is in zero net supply cancels out. And so what's left is this intertemporal budget constraint for the country, where this is the net foreign asset position of the country. And this is essentially the terms of savings internationally, right? The international interest rate. And so this is the accumulation of net foreign assets on this side. And the right-hand side is net exports. So these are revenues in foreign currency from commodity exports, because we you know, simplify that it's only commodity exports. And this is the expenditure on imports, given the price of imports. And it's all written in terms of foreign currency. So there is no, not even an exchange rate in this equation. But this equation needs to be satisfied, right? And so this would be the crucial discipline, would be the budget constraint, right? You have to satisfy the intertemporal budget constraint um, and finally, there is the earlier equation. And for a part of our analysis, I'm gonna ignore earlier equation because we're gonna be in steady state and, and like uh, take it as a one-time permanent shock and uh, do a competitive static between steady states. And then you just assume that in steady state, you know, everything is stabilized. So earlier equation is about dynamics. So it's not a binding condition. You just check that it's satisfied. But the earlier equation is really this desire to save. And so what is the desire to save? There are two reasons for it. You want to smooth your import consumption and that's why you save in foreign currency. And the, the benefit of saving is that you get an interest rate. As a household, you can get an interest rate on your foreign currency savings. It doesn't have to be the same interest rate as the international one if there are financial depression in the domestic market. Right? Obviously, you discount future, right? And so this is how much dollars lose their value over time. If you can buy less goods, that is like sort of like less purchasing power ability, right? And finally, this is the piece which tells you that you do want to hold foreign currency as a saver, even if it pays a really bad return here. So even, even if there is a lot of financial repression and really low interest rate 
expected interest rate, your ability to withdraw the dollar and deposits and so on, this compels you to hold some of it, right? And so this is the force that, you know, this is this convenience yield thing that you are willing to hold dollar savings because you deem them as safe, even if uh, they are associated with very low return, with low interest rate on them, right? And so this is how we can capture this idea that there is a demand for saving, which will play a competing role with demand for imports. And this is where sort of the interesting stuff will happen. So there's okay. now kappa tilde is related to the kappa of the V function before now. Co correct. That. Yeah, it's some uh, some transformation of the kappa with some other parameters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so this is there are two elasticities that play a role: this theta, which you will see, and the kappa, which is in one proposition that I will not show you, but uh, I will tell you where where it matters. We kind of completely you see streamlined and did not have any other elasticities, as as I mentioned, of how you can. You know, for example, use oil in the domestic economy to enhance domestic production. It's not there. Mm -hmm. Or how you can intertemporally, instead of selling oil today, keep it in the ground and sell it in the future or sell oil in the ground, for example, to China and receive dollars now for oil in the ground. So all of this is not there. We kind of capture it in terms of like cash flows, right? The, today's cash flow, right? And so there could be a future cash flow. It's, it's a whole path of this white stars. So it's allowed in that way. Okay, very good. So with this, we can go to the analysis, right? And so, you know, we mentioned a bunch of sanctions. So sanctions could be on experts or if oil prices go up, this can go up. Uh, they can be on imports. You can either be rationed or there could be like a tax, right? Either you cannot buy same imports at the same price anymore. You have to pay more or you just, some, some imports are not, are just not available as varieties anymore, right? So both is allowed here. Uh, you know, like the domestic recession will be captured this way. So if there is like a, a problems with intermediate uh, supply, intermediate good supply or exit of foreign multinationals from the economy, this can trigger a domestic recession. So this could be captured with a change like that. There could be a freeze of foreign assets, which actually happened in the first week of the war. There was a freeze on net foreign, on the reserves of the government. So it's essentially this shock. Uh, there, there, there could be exclusions from international financial market. And very interestingly, you don't have to change equations. You just say, you don't get an interest rate. For, you can only save now. You cannot have borrowing internationally. And you don't get any interest rate on saving. You just heard foreign currency if you run trade surpluses. And so in that sense, set of equations doesn't change. And the households also cannot, you know, if the households want to hold currency, it has to come from the domestic reserve, from domestic net foreign assets, right? And then this is the shock. And so the policy instruments we've, uh, already discussed, right? That the, that the, that the government has. So we can uh, we can go straight to the analysis now. Uh, I have a little less than fifteen minutes, so I think I should be able to show you all the results. Now. Okay. So first, just to get started, it's a little bit of a warm up exercise. I'm going to go to a Cobb Douglas utility, which just makes equations easy. Uh, but you know, obviously, more generally, I don't want to be there because Cobb Douglas is quite quite peculiar. And so given that, uh, if I, I will be in steady state, so I don't need to really check this equation because it will be somehow satisfied in steady state. There is no dynamics, right? So all of this will be constant. And so it's just that this interest rate needs to offset this demand. Uh, but so this would be the interplay of these two equations of the demand for uh, imports and then intertemporal budget constraint, which both become static now. So in the long run sense, these are imports, like some average imports or steady state imports. These are steady state experts. And this is the annuity flow on net foreign assets, right? And this is the demand for imports, where instead of, you know, the consumption of domestic goods is just Y. And so the idea here is that the import sanctions will be reflected in the increase. If, if you are rationed, like initially you wanted to consume a range of varieties gamma, of imports, and now uh, range of varieties delta became unavailable. In this model, there would be an increase in the effective price that you face, and the demand schedule will just look like this. So it still will be moving together with the price of imports, right? But it's like the import ration is like a shift in that demand schedule. And I'm gonna tell you uh, the intuition sort of where it's, uh, where it's coming from, okay. And so here, just putting these two equations together, again, the logic is very simple. You just need to satisfy the budget constraint and you need to be on your demand for import schedule. That's the only two equations that we're using. You can solve for 
uh, equilibrium exchange rate. And so here are the forces for equilibrium exchange rate. And this is sort of essentially spells out all the mechanism. So check it out. If sanctions are on experts, so they reduce Y star or on net foreign assets, this shrinks this side uh, of the budget constraint. Resources become unavailable. You cannot afford the same quantity of imports. So the way the market would adjust to that is by depreciating the exchange rate. So this shrinks which means that this goes up, which is a ruble depreciation. So sanctions that are focused either on net foreign assets or on experts will depreciate the exchange rate. And the idea is you cannot afford imports. So exchange rate from this equation needs to move in such a way that in equilibrium, you don't want to buy those imports. And so basically weak exchange rate makes imports expensive and you substitute your expenditure away from imports. And that ensures that you satisfy the intertemporal budget constraint, right? So sanctions on this side of the economy, on, on basically the income side of the intertemporal budget constraint, uh, uh, will uh, depreciate the exchange rate. Now, this is the domestic part of the economy. So either domestic inflation, right? Monetary inflation, or domestic, uh, so this going up, this will depreciate the exchange rate. Domestic recession, when Y goes down, will actually push this down and appreciate the exchange rate. So what's the intuition here? So this is interesting. So if there is domestic recession, you actually cannot afford, you know, if this is the only shock that happened, you cannot really buy the domestic goods anymore that you like. And so in this model, if you cannot buy the domestic goods, you also want to reduce your expenditure on imports, right? But the imports must satisfy the budget constraint. So you need to buy the same quantity of them. So the only way you're gonna sustain the same amount of imports during the domestic recession, if exchange rate appreciates. So the first force, if, if the sanctions, their effect on the domestic output are stronger than on experts in some ways, that could lead to an appreciation of the currency. Again, because you know things are bad in the domestic economy and you don't want to consume imports in parallel with that, but you have to be convinced by lower prices of imports, right? So this is how it works. This is peculiar to a particular elasticities that we assumed here. So this effect happens under this particular Cobb Douglas utility that, that we, we've assumed. With other utilities, you can get effects going in other directions here, right? Uh, the other effects that I'm talking about are robust. And finally, what is the effect on the, of import sanctions? And this is something I'm gonna focus more on. So remember that import sanctions kind of raise the effective price of imports that you face. Right? They don't change the actual price uh, that you pay, right? but you're just being told you're not allowed to get a bunch of varieties anymore. Right? And so here, um, uh, basically what happens if you cannot get a bunch of varieties anymore, uh, then you, know, you still need to spend your intertemporal budget right, on the varieties that you like less. And so this is, uh, so there is a paper by, uh, with Lorenzoni and Van Derden, which really focuses on this part of the mechanism is that, you know, you need to, you still need to allocate expenditure to imports that you do not like. And how will you be compelled to buy those imports, right? If you cannot buy Italian shoes, you have to switch to Chinese shoes. Previously, you didn't want to buy them at the prices that you faced, right? You wanted the Italian shoes. Italian shoes are no longer available. You have to switch to the available ones. And the only way to compel you to spend your resources on those shoes that you actually did not want is if they become cheaper. And they become cheaper by means of an exchange rate adjustment. And it's, an exchange, it's, it's a ruble appreciation in that case, right? And so this is, from the point, this is the equilibrium from the point of view of the goods market. Uh, in a way, it's much easier to think about it from the point of view of the currency market. Imagine you know, Europe says you cannot buy uh, our goods, but you still have plenty of revenues from sale and export from selling uh, natural resources. You have this inflow of currency into the country, which you cannot really spend on the uh, previously available uh, imports, then some of them are no longer available. So you have an abundance of currency in the domestic economy. And this is the force to the depreciation, uh, to the appreciation of the ruble, depreciation of the foreign currency against the ruble, right? And so this will be a very robust intuition that once we bring in the financial market in as a competing use of currency, this would be the persistent intuition that will stay. It's really all gonna be about the inflow of currency and the alternative uses of it. Okay, very good. I'm, I'm not doing great on time. 
So let me go Let's very quickly. Speed up a little bit. Uh, yes. So let me go very quickly here. So the last condition that we need to satisfy is the government budget, right? So the government receives this and it needs to pay for its wage commitment. And exchange rate is an endogenous variable here. And so, the, and so it's written in ruble terms. The wage commitment is in ruble terms. And the question is, what does this change in the exchange rate do to the tightness of the budget constraint? And so you plug in the exchange rate. And basically, you can see that the government would need to inflate if this constraint is tight. If this constraint is not tight, the government budget is slack, essentially, right? It can even increase the payments. But if this constraint is tight, the only way to deal is either default on the promises or increase inflation and reduce the promises in real terms. And sort of not surprisingly, the key force here is, well, if you promised a lot, it's hard to pay for it. Or if you have a domestic recession, it's hard to pay for it. But what's interesting is that, you know, you have both export sanctions and import sanctions that also affect your budget constraint through the exchange rate. Through the, essentially, you have to convert your oil revenues back into rubles, and it can tighten the exchange rate. And so this is something I'm going to focus on in a minute. Okay, so this is the summary of the results that I already mentioned, right, so of how different sanctions work. And so now I want to show you a very general result, actually, which is really behind uh, this paper. And so this result is based on a completely fascinating result by uh, Abba Lerner from many years ago, almost 100 years ago. So this is a learner symmetry result, and it's completely fascinating. It states that import the effect of an import tariff is equivalent to an effect of an export tax. And in that sense, as soon as somebody tells you that you can use import tariffs uh, to deal with current account deficit, it should ring a bell. It's sort of, it seems weird, right? Like how can import tariff deal in the same way with current account deficit as an export tax? It seems that they operate in completely opposite directions, right? And so the idea behind this is that it's again, it's in the temporal budget constraint. Both of these policies will reduce the total amount of trade, but you have to be subject to intertemporal budget constraint. So you put a wedge in your ability to trade. You will trade less, but intertemporal budget constraint says that the effect of both wedges should be comparable, right? You will reduce both imports and exports as a result of it. And how does the adjustment happen? Well, it turns out that relative wages and exchange rates have to adjust to support it as an equilibrium. So it could be either relative wages between countries or the exchange rate. Typically, we think of exchange rate as doing the adjustment in flex flexible exchange rate environments. And basically, exchange rate needs to move in opposite directions, depending on whether you do an import tariff or an export tax, you're going to get the same allocation supported by a differential movement and exchange rate, right? Uh, if you have an import tariff, you know, uh, you cannot uh, really buy imports and you export too much. How can you have the adjustment? Well, you need the domestic wage to go up. So you export less, you know, and uh, given the tariff want to import a little more. So it's equivalent to an exchange rate appreciation. If you have an export tax, then you don't export sufficiently, you, need to, you import too much, and the only way to adjust is for your wages to come down or exchange rate to depreciate. And that's literally what's gonna be behind this result. And it's remarkable how robust learner symmetry is, right? And so something that we can prove, and it's interesting that our model does not have Ricardian equivalence. So there is an issue between the government budget and the household budget, right? There is a tension between the two, uh, but uh, in, in, through the asset market, but it turns out that learner symmetry works in models without regard to equivalence. It actually kind of sa satisfy equivalence of allocation, budget set by budget set. That's why it doesn't require regard to equivalence. And one result is kind of uh, very interesting here. Okay, so what, what is the result? The result is that if you do expert sanctions combined with an initial net foreign asset freeze, that's exactly equivalent to import sanctions. Whether you rush on imports or increase the price of imports with a tax, but like if you do it by 10% and you do this by 10%, they're going to result in exactly the same allocation. And so how do you prove it? Well, you go back to the budget constraint, to the intertemporal budget constraint. And you can sort of see that you can, you know, this is the export revenues divided by the price of imports. To the extent you make this guy move down by the same amount, as long as you do the right adjustment to net foreign assets in the beginning, right? You actually make feasible literally the same allocation. And then the exchange rate becomes just the side equation. 
exchange rate will adjust in a way to support it as an allocation. So if sanctions happened on this side, right? Well, you have to reduce your import consumption. Imports, uh, you cannot buy as much imports if there were export sanctions and the adjustment will happen through only this term. And so exchange rate will have to depreciate if it's export sanctions. But if sanctions came on the import side, then again, you know, you increase this, this whole object goes down. You can afford less imports because imports have become more expensive, but you have all this exports, right? And so the only way to kind of go back to an equilibrium that this is partially offset by movement here. And if this elasticity is greater than one, which is a typical assumption that you can substitute between the domestic and foreign goods, right? We think of this elasticity as bigger than one, then you would need to have an appreciation, right? In order to satisfy the same budget constraint, right? Uh, you know, again, the intuition is you have inflow of currency from experts, but you cannot afford the imports. And the only way to make co co consumers happy with that is if the, if the exchange rate is stronger, basically, right? So you, you, know, you, you still buy a little more of the imports that, than the one that is rationed, right? But, uh, but in the end of the day, you end up with less imports and a partially appreciated exchange rate. And we can quantitatively put this all the, this movements here depend on the extent of sanctions and the elasticity. And this is something that could be contrasted directly with the data. So one thing that I'm gonna show you very quickly, and this is one of the surprising and fascinating- what, the, what you're saying is that the West by imposing that sanction or the other sanction is just determining the exchange rate with the ruble. Correct. So the exchange rate is like what a side equation. The goal of both sanctions is to really tighten stuff here and tighten the fiscal constraint of the, like if you want to hurt the economy, it's you want to do the effect here. And mm -hmm. the effect is literally the same, whether you do one set of sanctions or the other. The second goal could be, and this is also reflected in the real cost of living. And the spectacular result here is, well, it's not surprising that real cost of living will increase in proportion to import share in GDP. This is like a halt and result and that elasticity of substitution that will play a role here. But the amazing thing is it doesn't matter whether you do sanctions on imports or exports, you're gonna impose the same real cost of living increase for the economy, right? So while it's the import share in GDP that matters for the magnitude of the effect, it really doesn't matter whether you use import, import or export sanctions. So now another interesting object is the government fiscal revenues. And not surprisingly, the effect on government fiscal revenues will be proportional to the share of revenues from exports in total government revenues, right? So if the government receives a lot of revenues from exports, which is the case in the Russian economy, the recent budgets show that about 60% of government revenues uh, comes from exports of natural resources. So this is a very large number, right? And so then it's the theta minus one, that's the LSE that's relevant here. So this is the effect on the budget uh, uh, on the budget balance in rubles, right? And the fascinating thing is it really doesn't matter whether you do export or import sanctions. And what's the intuition here? Well, the intuition in the end of the day is if you convert export revenues back into rubles, the effect will be the same on the export and import sanctions. It will work differentially in this, in, on the export sanctions, it would be the shrinkage in Y star and a depreciation of the currency that, oh, and that's part of that effect. Here with import sanctions, it would be fully the effect of appreciation of the ruble, which will put strain on the government, on, on the government fiscal deficit. In that sense, the second question that we asked in the beginning of the talk, does it make it easier for Russia to finance the war? This model gives the answer that there is some sense of equivalence. Uh, I mean, obviously you, these two sets of sanctions, they magnify each other. If you do one, you can do the other on top of it and the effects will be more magnified. But if you really achieved all you wanted with import sanctions, right? There is no, uh, like if already imports are at the minimum, which obviously is a case you cannot make, but if imports were at the minimum, then there is no uh, residual role of export sanctions, even from the point of view of the government budget constraint. It's a little weird because, you know, the Russian government receives, you know, this uh, tens of uh, billions of euros in revenues, but the exchange rate appreciates and makes the euro revenues less valuable in rubles, harder to satisfy the ruble wage commitment. Of course, to the extent that a big part of government expenditure is in, in euros itself or in dollars, then this logic doesn't work anymore. This logic only works from the point of view of the government uh, balance in rubles. So can, okay. I, can I ask uh, mm -hmm. one quick question? 
So there's this equivalence. I was wondering when it breaks down. So let's suppose I enlarge the model and the exchange rate movement is also used as a signal, even though it shouldn't be used as a signal Perfect. how strong the economy is and it induces yes. bank runs and other things, then it wouldn't work. Yes. Uh, so we should yes. actually impose this in such a way to make the Russian economy look weak, even if it is not weaker, de facto. If, if exchange rate for some reason shows up in some objective function or is used as a signal, then it has differential effect on the exchange rate. Absolutely. Mm, yeah. But from the point of view of real cost of living, of the actual inflation that people should see in the supermarket, uh, it doesn't matter, it turns out. Right. But if, it's if this is not observable easily and exchange rate is used as a signal, then yes, then exchange rate become a goal in itself. That's correct. Okay, and so I will take just a few more minutes. And so there is this interesting last result about the financial shock, which I think is sort of like what really happened as well in the Russian economy. Uh, there was both financial autarky imposed on Russia and a financial shock that people did not trust the domestic financial system in the beginning and really wanted to switch to foreign currency, right? So here's, here's a couple of possibilities, right? So imagine that there is the shock in this earlier equation. So we're now, finally using the earlier equation. So imagine there is a shock. And so there are three ways the government can respond to it. Uh, so one way would be to provide this. To the, if, if the government has reserves, it really can provide it to the households. If they want to hold dollars, the government has reserves. And this is what's been done in typical normal times. There is a shock that triggers bigger demand for foreign currency. This is how the reserves they, reserve they're used. The government really can change the uh, currency of its balance sheet, provide this liquidity to the private sector, and there is no other change, right? So all of the effect of it will stay in this bracket. It will not affect imports or exchange rate or anything else. Of course, if foreign reserves are no longer available, and so these were the sanctions on foreign reserves, this is no longer an option for the government, right? Then you have to choose between two. One is just let things happen or do financial repression. And so let's see what happens in those so, alternative so like, I want to come back to, so uh -huh. this, just to understand it, it's a, a preference shift that is this psi t. It's not a, an increase in volatility. No, no. It's just a one-time shift that you want to hold more foreign currency because you are concerned about the future and you think foreign currency provides a better you know, way and of saving. Just coming back to my uh, subscript T plus one, does B start subscript T plus one, it's known at time T when I make my choice or it's only known at it, T plus one? Yes, it's a choice made at T, yeah. So I know it, so it's measurable at time T, not Yes, T. yes, okay. and so the government can accommodate it uh, without any uncertainty. Okay. Yeah, and so here, here are the answers what the government can do, right? So I mentioned that uh, there could be foreign exchange rate policy with full accommodation. So they can basically sell reserves and provide foreign currency liquidity to the private sector. And this is fully insulate imports and exchange rate. So there would be no movements on imports or exchange rate now. And this is what typically a lot of countries do uh, during normal times. This is a very important policy instrument to smooth exchange rate fluctuations, right? In response to the shifts in capital inflows and outflows. And so uh, the previous paper that we wrote with Dima was literally studying the optimal policy under this regime. Right. But we assume that this regime is not feasible. And then there are two options. One option is a passive government when the government does nothing, does not do financial repression, does not do FX interventions. And then here's where the competing use of currencies comes into play. If people really want to save in foreign currency, they have to cut on imports. And so this will be associated with an exchange rate depreciation. This is driven by the earlier equations, like you shift into not consuming, but into saving. Uh, and this is sustained by a fall in imports and associated depreciation as you accumulate foreign currency from under-consuming imports, basically, right? And so this is the effect uh, that would happen when the economy is hit by the savings shock, by, by like a strong demand either for capital outflows from the country or for precautionary savings on foreign currency, right? This is kind of the same in the model. And so the big exchange rate depreciation initially in the first week we think were, was triggered by the shock, right? But then the government has this third policy tool, which is financial repression. And so you see what the government can do in response to a big demand for foreign currency, it can really reduce the expected return. It can make it very difficult to withdraw foreign currency. It can impose a big tax on holding foreign currency or, or changing foreign currency, 
or there could be bans on uh, on ex, ex, uh, on exporting foreign currency and sending it abroad. And all of this was done in the first couple of weeks of the recession. And so, you know, we think that the initial response looked like this in the first week, which triggered the devaluation. But then it was replaced by very steep financial repression of various sorts, and this stabilized the currency. And so, what's interesting that the government can achieve a stable exchange rate with this policy, or whatever exchange rate it really wants by choosing the uh, extent of financial repression here, but it's not without cost. It's really by the repressing the domestic savers. So the cost comes not for uh, consumers of goods, it comes for the domestic savers because they face financial repression. Can you give us and, explicit examples? How did they do it? I cannot hold dollar assets anymore. I have to pay a tax or so what did they do? There were many different things. And so in particular, when things got better, so at first all the exporters had to sell almost essentially all of their export revenues and foreign currency to the central bank, 80%. Now it's been reduced to 50 because you don't need as much financial repression anymore, right? So with the idea that the exporters could keep currency away from the country, and this, the central bank made them bring the currency in, right? And now it does not require as much currency to be brought in. Also, you could only, uh, you could only send $5,000 abroad uh, for an extended period of time, and now they increase it to 150. So basically what happens, and so I'm going to go back to the picture and kind of study those different parts, right, is, uh, uh, is when different policies had a bite, right? So I, I, I will take one more minute. One thing I was going to show you, there was yeah. something very interesting. Uh, what you're asking, there was a 12% tax on buying dollars. Funny enough, you had to pay the same tax on euros and pounds, but not on Swiss franc. And so to show that this is really a market price of currency, it's very interesting. We can look at Swiss exchange rate against the dollar in Russia relative to foreign markets. Mm -hmm. And so as you can see, it's always like this relative exchange rate is always at one. In logs, it's at zero. But during the period of the tax, the relative exchange rate in the Russian economy really moved with the tax. So economy is very responsive to this taxes imposed on it, right? And so this is where, this is a relative turnover. So everybody switched to trade in Swiss francs. A lot of, I mean, this is an increase in turnover of Swiss francs during this period. And then people went back to dollars when this tax was, uh, you know, was, was taken out. Uh, so the last thing I was going to say, I think this is just a very important result. Do you result, see when the I'm, Swiss decided to join the sanctions? Did, I forgot they didn't join initially. Somehow they, they kept Swiss franc as a small, it's a very small currency in terms of turnover. So even that increase in turnover, you know, it didn't make it a big currency in the market. The turnover increased, you know, three or fourfold but it still kept it as a fairly small currency from the point of view of households. It's not the currency in which they were making savings anyways, right? But some so, agents in the financial market really went there. So all I can have to make a conclusion soon. Yes, so this will be my conclusion. One thing I was going to say uh, is, do you ever want to use financial repression? So one thing that we can show is that in the representative agent economy, financial repressions are unambiguously bad. They reduce wealth. But once you go in a heterogeneous agent model and you have agents that save and agents that consume, like hand to mouse consumers and savers, what financial repression does, it really hurts the savers, but it benefits the consumers because it smoothes out exchange rate movements, right? With the idea that imports are more affordable, right? So the problem is that in the economy of heterogeneous agents, if you have rich agents that really wanna herd dollars for savings reasons, mm -hmm. it takes away foreign currency from the other part of the economy that would have used it to buy imports. And so if your goal is to kind of like really uh, do something with the welfare of the poorer hand to mouse agents, financial repression actually becomes welfare improving by hurting, you know, welfare improving in some utilitarian maybe sense by hurting savers and trying to smooth out, you know, reduce the costs to consumers, reduce the extent of increase in the uh, consumer cost of living, right? And then financial repression becomes interesting. I think many countries, potentially use financial repression for that reason. So here's my conclusion. So let's just go back to this graph. What happened? Freeze of net foreign assets, a highly unanticipated move by Europe to freeze net foreign assets. And that's the sanction that works to depreciate the currency. A run on the banks, a psi shock. People really want to take out the deposits and keep them in foreign currency. And this then financial repression was switched on. So the initial month, is the tension between the, in the financial market between sanction on the reserves, um, uh, precautionary savings shock, and financial repression. Financial repression stabilizes it. And then this is when realization comes that uh, 
uh, you know, the export revenues are so much bigger than import expenditure. Russia is running the spectacular trade surplus. And so this is the force for a long-term appreciation of the ruble. You know, once the, there is no financial panic and kind of a bubble solution with, you know, bubble and exchange rate, once that's stabilized, then we have this fundamental forces coming from the intertemporal budget constraint, which really pushed the ruble stronger than it was before. And it's not surprising because exports are so much bigger than imports now. And so now we are in the area where the central bank really wants to reduce financial repression. They have it too much. They don't want such a strong ruble because it puts so much pressure on the fiscal uh, balance of the, of the Ministry of Finance now. So the central bank is trying to reduce financial repression, re reduction of the home interest rate is part of it as well, in order to not have the stiff appreciation of the ruble because it makes the life of Ministry of Finance very difficult. And so here's a big difference uh, between export and import sanctions, right? So export sanctions would probably be associated with a much more devalued exchange rate, while import sanctions, they, you know, put the central bank in the position that the only thing that they need to do is avoid uh, excessive appreciation of the ruble. They do not need to do any inflation to resolve the budget constraint. They only need to avoid excessive appreciation, and that would be fine to relax uh, the budget constraint, right? And so what we study in the paper, to what, also, to what extent it's possible without inflation to relax the budget constraint by means of relaxing financial repression here. And the answer is, under certain circumstances, that actually can relax the budget, uh, budget constraint of the government without inflation. Let me stop here. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Oleg. So let me just ask you your first question. Where do you think the ruble will be at the end of the year? Yes. So, I mean, uh, we're, uh, all of our theories say that, you know, random walk forecasts are the best forecast. So you take the value today, which is 55, yeah, this is the one without sanctions, I guess. Correct. Right. So, but here's the big consideration that I think we have to keep in mind. So first of all, uh, if we look at the budget deficit, they really cannot afford such a strong ruble. So they, they really have a huge incentive to weaken the ruble right now to relax the pressure on the budget constraints of the government. And so this would be, I think, the primary force which will lead to depreciation from now because the government really, central bank really wants to relax uh, financial depression, undo it almost completely and let ruble kind of somewhat mean revert back to relax the uh, uh, pressure on the budget constraints. The other thing is we're gonna see more and more imports coming in through some shadow channels, right? So Russia mm -hmm. will figure out a way to buy imports and this is the force that will depreciate the currency, right? Like once sanctions are really steep on imports, uh, uh, the ruble is strong. But as soon as there is this ways of buying alternative goods from other countries, this would be a force for depreciation of the ruble. Finally, Europe promised not to buy Russian oil starting in December, uh, which would be another shock. Uh, and already now on the export side. So if I think about fundamental forces, I see a lot of forces for uh, ruble depreciation going forward. But obviously the market must be somewhat forward looking to some extent. And so some of it is already priced in perhaps. And so in that sense, you really always, like my, my prediction would be somewhere between where ruble is now and somewhat weaker. So if I had to choose that one answer, I would say it will revert back to 75 basically. And the government will try to keep it there. And, and you would say that should we care about the exchange rate or should we not care about the exchange rate? Uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I think in the end of the day, it's an allocative relevant variable. I think what happens to exchange rate right now is very clearly a, not a situation of strength, uh, but of shocks to the economy. Completely mm -hmm. unusual, unprecedented shocks, which happen to be much uh, heavier on the import side. And so in that sense, I think what you can read off from the data is that sanctions are actually working. Uh, you know, it's just the composition of sanctions were such that they create this force for this completely unprecedented appreciation of the ruble. And then everything that concerns financial repression, right? I think the government really has this tool of choosing uh, what to do, like of what are the agents in the economy that it wants to suppress, are this the consumers or the savers? And in that sense, exchange rate is also an allocative variable. And so like all the actions of the central bank now, I think they're driven by these two considerations, right? One is send the correct signal about the value of the exchange rate, that the economy is strong, as, as you pointed out. But two is actually uh, relax the situation of one important agent for, for, for the government is the government budget constraints. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what happens with exchange rate now, we can 
uh, read it off as the ability to, as the attempt to relax the uh, constraints on the fiscal, fiscal budget constraints. Thanks a lot, Oleg, for bringing back uh, our learners' insights uh, from 1936 uh, to the real world and helping us to understand much better how much emphasis we should uh, put on the exchange rate movements in order to interpret whether sanctions work or not. I appreciate it. I think it's very useful to understand this and it shows the value of economics. And we stay in touch and keep talking and um, keep following what's going on in the real world. And thanks to all the listeners and hope to see you soon. Uh, again with for the next webinar series. Thanks a lot, Marcus. Thanks. Bye-bye.